Hello everybody. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, it's live now. Good evening or wherever you're from. Um, just mute this one. Okay, so first, can everybody hear me? Just a quick audio check before I start. Can somebody write in chat if you can actually hear me? I think I have a five second delay or something on the stream. But I think you should, yeah, okay. Confirmation, that's all right. So welcome and then let's jump right into it. Basically what I'm going to do tonight is we go through a few cases that I recently discussed with one of my fellows. And I do this, sometimes I have um, three people that I do one-on-one -on -one teaching with and they send me their own cases where they have questions or struggle with them and then we discuss them on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis and we now show you or i show you now five four or five cases that i recently discussed i will show you what questions the students had and how we actually uh, came up with an answer hopefully so let me just open the first case here i hope you can all see this just quickly change something here on my system. Yep, like this, very good. And opening up this one. Okay, so you should now be seeing the, the MRI here, me scrolling through, just activating the pencil here. So basically, this was the first case that um, I was shown to, and you can see it's an MR of the shoulder. And I quickly show you the finding that the student was asking me what to make out of it and you can first of all you can easily see there is some bursitis here so this is not an arthrogram this is just a standard mri and let's just put this one here so okay so you can see the bursitis and the question that the student had was regarding this tear here so let me zoom in a little bit more so you can clearly see there is a tear here the tendon and then we have some fluid like signal all the way down here and it looks like some fibers might be attaching here onto the bone and his question was is this like a full thickness tear so basically this one is obviously a tear on the dorsal side but does the tear goes through here up to the articular side or not or whether these are two separate tears or what to make out of it so it's quite tricky and let me just split the screen here pull maybe which one this one up here so first of all what we can see here this kind of tear we have to localize where it actually lies right so we can scroll all the way posteriorly and we can see here this is now matching where we can see this high signal On this side and sometimes at the transition zone where the infraspinatus tendon overlaps a little bit with the supraspinatus tendon it can be quite tricky to actually say is it now a supraspinatus tear or is it a infraspinatus tear and if we start on the medial side you can always follow the most anterior portion here of the infraspinatus and you just follow it all the way laterally so we can still see this is the anterior border or portion of the infraspinatus here this one and then we can start how it overlaps here and it goes over here and so this one is on the infraspinatus side okay because it's the more superficial one here so it's just lifted up here and what about this one and this kind of other findings here so it's a little bit special because we have some underlying bony irregularities and I think it's better visible on one of the other sequences. Um, I can show you this here. This is even better. So not all the high signal you can see here is actually a tear of the tendon. And I think that's one of the tricky things of this case. So these are some of them at least are subchondral or subchondral sub cortical bone cysts like tiny cysts here that are well shown here on this uh, heavily fluid uh, sensitive sequence here and if we go back to the PD 
you can see it's not so popping out as on this one here so it's really important to make sure to really verify what you see whether it's actually in the footprint of the tendon or below the bone plate and we can now try to make out what it actually is for this some um, thin slices are very good and you can see the irregularities here already so the bone is very irregular and if we do a NPR you will probably not see this no okay so anyways I can't show you this because it's just streaming this window here but nevertheless I can also zoom in here a little bit more so you can see this high signal here this is a cyst subcortical cyst this one too this one too we've got several of them even this one here and if we scroll anteriorly you can see this one here this is not a tear in the tendon actually this is a subcortical cyst here at the footprint which is a result of the tendon tear that we are going to see here in a minute and this is the other tear on the dorsal side here okay so if we are now going even from this portion here more posteriorly so we have this kind of dorsal sided tear here then we have another tear here and again i think that's uh, that was the student's initial question we have tendon some of it is attaching here and this is like this so basically this is a tear this is some cysts that are still here under the bone so basically the bone plate would be something like this not be too big okay and then we have the bone or with some subcortical subcortical cyst here so this is again this is a tear this one here and this one as well but here we have some irregularities now the question is do they communicate so let me just go back here we have this tear here and there are not any fibers really left on this side uh, at least we think they are none left it's sometimes hard to say so we if we have the bony contours probably coming down here so there will not be much left so it could be a articular sided tear or interstitial depending on whether we decide that there is still something going on now this one clearly puts aside the tear so do they communicate or not what arguments do we have so one thing that i uh, think can give us an uh, indication is first of all we have quite a lot of fluid in the bursa here so if the tears would be communicating substantially i would expect more joint fluid as you can see here the axillary joint recess is basically just empty there is no fluid really in the joint except a little pouch here in uh, below the coracoid process here but there is no joint effusion for this amount of bursitis probably a little mismatch so I'm not really convinced that there's communication between this pulsar sided tear and this more either interstitial or articular sided tear. Anyways, both tears are closely together and you can see or I hope you can see that there is no obvious connection and it really looks like this one is still attached here to the bone. Now, a arthrogram would be very useful in uh, such cases initially i wouldn't recommend doing one now because the tears even if they don't communicate are in such close proximity that it could be relevant and even this one here is quite extensive so if they go in and do the repair they would just make this connection automatically during surgery and tuck everything back in so that was basically the question here so teaching point i would say that we have to be careful that there is actually not everything fluid like at this area of the footprint is actually um, tendon tears it can be subchondral or subcortical cyst sorry and we really have to make sure we look also like thin section uh, if we have so because the bony irregularity is nicely show here so there are a few other things that we could discuss in this case uh, for example it's always good to have like some kind of a gradient sequence where you can sometimes check for calcifications like hydroxyapatite depositions as you can see here so that's uh, probably a calcification and not just the tendon slip this is the most inferior portion of the subscapularis tendon and you can also see this here if we start on the medial side here we have this different 
tendon slips up to five, six of them. Then we have the normal insertion up top and we focus now on this inferior portion. And you can see there is this kind of black dot that's showing up here, this one. And this is not tendon, so it's there, then it's going because the most inferior portion is typically just the muscular insertion and this is probably a tiny bit of calcific tendinitis or hydroxyapatite. But the bursitis is most likely not caused by this. I think that's just a coincidental finding. Now, why does he have bursitis? This is also something we should try to figure out. And why he has the tear in the first place, right? And I think these are sometimes underestimated on MR or we maybe don't really look at them. But you can nicely see these really sharp edged uh, antisophytes here, right? So this is uh, quite impressive. Uh, you can imagine if you elevate your arm, there will be most likely uh, friction going on at this area here in a sense of a impingement. You will probably injure your tendon at some point. You will get bony reactions at the facet, at the middle facet, etc. So it's always good to make out for these kind of osteophytes because if they go in and do surgery, they will have to resect these. So they just do uh, cut them away, basically. Other findings in this case are of less importance. There is a little bit of edema in the lateral clavicle. Joint capsule may be slightly irritated, but this is something we can so often see. And I'm actually planning currently a video, a regular video on my YouTube channel where I discuss AC pathology or more uh, bone marrow edema in the AC joint, what to make out of it. Because this frequently causes confusion, especially for younger colleagues, if they see a little bit of edema and then it's very quickly they come to the conclusion that it's actually a AC joint osteoarthritis, which is probably inflamed or clinically relevant, where in fact, most of the time it's silent clinically at least. Um, but again, you will see the video and uh, there is a very different uh, studies that are dealing with this topic and they all have different conclusion. It's kind of funny, depending on which paper you read, you get a completely different approach to these kind of things. But just based uh, on my experience, uh, most of the time they are not really relevant and also not super important anyways. Yeah, I think that's it for the first case. So guys, if you have any questions, uh, I can read the chat. So just pop it in. We can have a look together at it. The delay, it's not too bad. I think it's just a few seconds. It's better than last time where it was uh, slightly more. Um, yeah, but otherwise I would continue with the next case. So this is, let me just check the age, 72 year old patient and has knee pain on the lateral side, as you can imagine with this kind of bone marrow edema. Now, there was a question that uh, the student had in this case. And the question was because the edema is not like you remember, if you remember like uh, uh, subchondral insufficiency fractures, for example, then you remember that you actually have this kind of subchondral lines at this level and you get a lot of bone marrow edema, which could look similar to this, but we have kind of a sparing at this level, right? So it's something maybe different, we will see. And, oh, oh, thank, thank you, Bruno, again for your uh, super chat. That's very kind of you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You already did last time, so I don't forget the names. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's quite a funny. Uh, anyways, if you, if you have questions, again, feel free to ask. So basically, bone marrow edema, a lot of uh, inflammation also, or edema is going on on the lateral aspect here. Now, this is an interesting case because if you look at the transfer sections, we can see there is quite extensive edema around the joint capsule and everything. So this is um, interesting. and. What the student also noticed, and I think it's better seen on the sagittal, that there is a little bit of bone marrow edema in the fabella. And the question was, could it be fabella syndrome? So could it be the equivalent of sesamoiditis at the greater toe, but just at the level of the knee? And there is a fabella syndrome, and it's, it has been published that it can be painful, etc. But the argument that this is not just the fabella syndrome is because the main finding actually is more or less the bone marrow edema in the lateral femoral condyle. 
And if you look closely on one of the non-fat saturated sequences, uh, let me just see where this was. So here. So you can see there is a little bit of signal change here, just or close to opposite of the patella. And the question was, is this somehow related? So did the patella, uh, did the fabella somehow impact this area here? And we have something like a, um, I don't know, like bone bruise or, or anything, anything like that. And there are a few arguments here that we can uh, say that why that's not true or probably not true. First of all, it's not really matching the fabella, right? If you look closely, fabella is here. It's a little bit more on the lateral side as opposed to this kind of little area here in the bone. It could technically be that if the femur is slightly rotated internally, that this one gets rotated out and there could be maybe some interaction here. That's possible. But I think key to this case is actually to really carefully look for subchondral changes. And if you go to the level where we have the bone marrow edema, like for example here, let me just zoom in, I hope you can see this. So we have, we have obviously the bone marrow edema, but here there is a little bit of a line here, just parallel, more or less parallel to the, or irregularity rather, maybe not just the line, but it's a little bit irregular here, just beneath the subchondral plate. And the bone marrow edema seems to be actually centered around this, right? So here again, here we are not really sure. And this is basically the, just the same thing as we know it from subchondral insufficiency fractures of the knee, where we have the exact same subchondral changes here, and then uh, the bone marrow edema centered more in this area here. So that's uh, basically my conclusion that this is related to subchondral insufficiency fracture or the spectrum of subchondral insufficiency fractures of the knee, but just at a, a little bit more atypical location on the more posterior side here. It could well be if the patient, I don't know the exact history, but if the patient is uh, flexing the knee or doing a lot of squats, I, I wouldn't think so with that age, but you can imagine, so uh, if the knee is flexed, basically we then have the whole thing like shifted like this, right? So this portion gets rotated here. And actually, if you then squat or whatever, it could technically become weight bearing. And therefore you can surely have subchondral insufficiency fracture also at that level. There is no reason why that should not be possible. So the question is then why does the fabella has edema? It could well be just like mechanical. It could, because the patient did not have a trauma, rem remember that. So, or it's just some secondary reaction because we also have a lot of soft tissue edema, as you can see, probably best on this kind of axial here, even on the distal portions of the musculature, etc. Even down here. Now, there is something in addition in this case, and I think it shows here. Look at the musculature, right? So this is certainly something we have to consider. This is not normal, right? So this is very, very important to realize. And if you scroll here through, it's more than just some kind of fatty atrophy. And I think we kind of lack some history here. There was no um, chronic disease known and the patient is 70 something years old. So the well, one of the differentials would be some kind of a myopathy. It could be diabetes from chronic denervation uh, because it's very extensive. It could also be maybe something uh, more extensive, um, some spine surge, uh, surgery or maybe nerve damage higher up. But we don't have that information. But in such cases, I would be giving a few differentials, certainly diabetes, just because it's a common reason for kind of fatty atrophy. Remember, if you have a MR of the foot with all the intrinsic muscles, with fatty degeneration, it's most often an indication that the patient has actually diabetes. Yeah, this was just an uh, accessory finding. So uh, Bruno has a question. How can you tell the difference between a osteochondral lesion and an insufficiency fracture? Yes, that was also one of the questions. 
because he was then thinking maybe this is a uh, OCD or osteochondral defect. So the one thing I would mention is that the osteochondrosis disecans, the OCD, the proper OCD is basically a lesion in the more adolescent and younger people. It's not something you would expect in a 70 something year old patient. That's the first thing. And then the difference between a subchondral insufficiency fracture and an osteochondral lesion is that the cartilage is typically not really affected in a subchondral insufficiency fracture. And we can try to see this here. The cartilage is quite smooth. The patient is old, but the cartilage is not too bad in general. It's not like we have large chunks of cartilage missing. We don't see any, we can also check maybe here. We don't see any fissures. We don't have subchondral cysts, etc. It's really just this very, very subtle subchondral line. That's, or this kind of irregularity here. And this is also part of this. I think this is just a, uh, the trabecular, if you think about the trabecular grid, it's impacted, not impacted, but it's just deterior deteriorated. And potentially there's already some healing processes going on that we have a little bit more uh, or tiny bits of callus formations already. The, I'm not really sure the time delay. What was the time delay? Six weeks. So if that happened six weeks ago, technically we could expect maybe already some healing uh, processes. So that's that's the reason. So if the cartilage looks really nice and smooth, I don't think we should use osteochondral lesion because osteochondral lesion is just a descriptive term if we have damage to bone and cartilage and here we don't actually have cartilage damage. The case had some, um, so I hope this clarifies this for you, Bruno. Uh, otherwise, just uh, let me know in the chat. There are some other findings. We've got this kind of mucoid degeneration of the ACL with some uh, ganglion cyst here. I think the meniscus was not really good looking in this kind of anterior horn. Oh, and the patient was this, was it this patient? No, no, it was another patient. We we'll see then shortly. But before we move on to the next case, I would like to quickly show you this here. Um, this is now on the medial side. Just keep an eye on the anterior root here, how it goes here to the middle portion. And this very tiny transverse ligament, how it inserts into this upper edge here. So we'll have to keep this engram in mind because we will focus on this on the next case. So yeah, I'm scrolling just through, just try to remember how it this looks, how this looks. Okay, I think that's it. So now moving on to the next case, I think it's 20 minutes, that's good. So we have now here a 40 year old with knee locking. Okay. So it's a 40 year old with knee locking. And what else was the symptom? So knee locking and there seems to be a background inflammatory arthritis, but there were no other information given about the kind of arthritis. Um, so that's quite um, not so good because we will see that here just in a second. Now, I'm jumping right to the locking part of things. Look at this anterior horn here in this case. So what, what would you make out of it? It looks really strange, right? And we have, this is the anterior edge of the tibia. And the meniscus is just hanging over it, basically. This is not supposed to happen, right? So the meniscus um, should stay more or less at this level, okay? So this could well explain the locking of the patient. And look at the transverse ligament here. I'm zooming in a little bit. It's coming here. It's inserting here and not here. So if you remember the, the previous case, basically the transverse ligament was inserting on this top edge here. Oh, Ruben, thank you so much. I don't, I don't know the, <laughs> thank you so much for the super chat, Ruben. MX, I suppose this is Mexican, <laughs> Mexican dollars. Thank you so much, Ruben. Um, I really appreciate it. Thanks guys. Yeah, coming back to this one here. Look here, this is how it's supposed to be. And here, this kind of dot, if, if we go back, we can see the transverse ligament. It's inserting here. So, so what's actually happening? First of all, you can obviously see there is a tear. 
Um, this is not normal signal, it's also not normal morphology and it's just hanging over the edge here. But actually what, what hangs over the edge? And it's not so easy to appreciate and I think what actually happened, because this one should be this knot up here, that the tip basically, so this is the tip of the meniscus, this should, this is actually this one here. So the patient has some kind of a complex tear and the meniscus just flipped in this direction to maybe 90 degree and is now sitting here anteriorly to the edge here. So this is uh, obviously a very good reason to have locking when you flex the knee. And that's probably the reason why the patient initially also came. And I would say this is a complex tear because first of all, we have this horizontal component and this, this is technically a vertical component because we have this kind of 90 degree orientation. And then we have some meniscus substance up here. So it's really not just one tear. Um, then it goes in here and then it flips back normal here. How does this look on a coronal image? Well, remember we're on the middle side. So we are coming from the posterior portion here, zooming in. So we already see some internal sigma changes. And now we've got all this meniscus substance up here. It's quite unusual to have this meniscus um, flipping or hanging over this anterior portion. Most of the time it's happening at the meniscal tibial gutter where you have tiny meniscus flaps or bits here and they are also frequently missed. So really make sure you check for any kind of meniscus substance down here. I would not necessarily talk or write down meniscus fragment because at least in my understanding a fragment is like completely loose and this one is just a little bit flipped and that's when I use the term meniscus substance because I think it's uh, maybe a tick more accurate. So again here on the transverse you can also see it. this is the line of the bone so this is the bone and the meniscus is not really on the bone it's just anterior and then the adjacent joint capsule is also irritated etc etc. Now the case has a few other additional interesting findings as you probably already have seen. So this one here, very obvious edema in the supralateral hofer fat pad and it's exactly here above the um, femoral condyle and the patellar tendon. And this is a very typical finding in patellar tendon, lateral femoral condyle friction syndrome, sometimes also called supralateral hofer impingement. Um, this is now like the maximum variant you can see. It's very obvious, so everybody will see this. But these findings can be very subtle, especially in younger patients, where you just have a tiny bit of edema here between the patellar tendon and the lateral femoral condyle. And remember, at this level, we don't have bone, so the tip or the lower pole of the patella is actually here. On sagittals, also suggest you always have a look at the sagittals because you can always see this also very nicely there, okay? Now, the reason why he has this is also in this instance now a little bit more obvious than usually we have the trochlear groove here, the patella is uh, lateralized and is riding just over the lateral facet of the trochlea. And then we have all these cartilage damages as you can see here. So this is now like a deep cartilage damage. We have a very uh, obvious cartilage damage also here and then the adjacent bone mirror edema upon the edema lesion, if you will. So this is the femoropatellar osteoarthritis and then together with this Hofa, supralateral Hofa impingement. Now there was also a question that the student had and it was regarding this finding. So what do we make out of this? This is now a T2 weighted sequence, I believe, and you have cyst-like formation here and it's not inside the joint or the suprapatellar recess, it's actually within the prefemoral fat pad. And we can make sure we are right here. Look at this. We have this kind of cyst here, and it lies in this kind of fatty tissue. There is, seems to be always a little bit of fat just covering it here. And this has been described that you can get cystic lesions, um, they don't say in the publication, I just don't have it now here, but they don't say in the publication that they are ganglion cysts, but I would still believe that it's a ganglion cyst 
Um, technically, it could be also be something like a cystic degeneration or pseudobulsa that's occurring because of this chronic friction. But in this particular case, because we have this kind of very thin trophy sequence, and if you look closely here, it's a little bit polylobulated, right? We've got a little bit of a septum here. Then we have this very thin component here, which looks a little bit like a typical neck of a ganglion cyst. So that's why I think this is probably just a ganglion cyst that is going inside here because there was some damage to the synovium and the fat tissue and obviously we've got already this osteoarthritis and then it formed here and just is filling up this ganglion cyst here. Now this is just uh, one other sequence and I mentioned that the patient had a background inflammatory arthritis. Well, we don't know whether there are several joints or where, whether it's a rheumatoid arthritis or any other kind of arthritis or whether it's just a inflammatory arthritis of that set knee so we are not sure there so yet because they talked about inflammatory arthritis what we typically do and uh, at, the, at that institution but also in our own institutions is that we just if as soon as there is something with uh, inflammatory disease we give gadolinium this is kind of like a reflex we tend to have and now it looks like this right so this is t1 after gadolinium with fat saturation and we can see the synovium is vividly enhancing there is not a lot of joint diffusion though but we see a lot of enhancement going on here in the knee joint all the way down and the question is now is this a result of the background inflammatory arthritis or is this secondary because the knee is just irritated, inflamed because of the chronic conditions with the locking. Remember, this is the patient with this flipped or dislocated um, meniscus substance over the anterior edge of the medial tibia plateau. Or is this a underlying um, arthritis? So we can't be for sure 100%. One thing I would like to say, first of all, we would need more clinical information to really be sure and second, we normally don't give gadolinium intravenously for standard knees. So we don't really know or we don't have a good uh, or understanding of a just a 70-year-old knee. How old is the patient? Uh, it's 40, just 40-year-old. Uh, how such a knee behaves if they, there is irritation, if there is osteoarthritis, whether they have synovial enhancement or not. We simply don't give gadolinium enough to really get this experience. So what I would suggest in such cases, I would just leave it open because you don't want to mention, okay, there is uh, now synovitis because the patient has background inflammatory arthritis or whatever. I would just stick to the terms. It's synovial enhancement in, with synovitis, no effusion, uh, put it down there and then you can give two differentials. It's either from the background arthritis, depending on the clinical situation, or it could be secondary because we have this kind of meniscus pathology on the medial side, we have also this osteoarthritis in the femoral patellar joint. So that's it. Um, yeah, so Snoopy Stardust, I like the name, asks, do you ever need to give a contrast when you probably have just a ganglion cyst? Are there any exceptions? Yeah, so, Normally, if you have a ganglion cyst, and this is now true for any joint, if you're sure it's a ganglion cyst, then you don't necessarily have to give gadolinium. If you have the polylobulated structure, if you go back here. Um, so if I see something like this with the neck, with the chasing pathology, I would probably not give gadolinium because the probability that this is something uh, like this is, is very, very high. And it's also described that you can have cystic changes around here. I'll show you this after the gadolinium because there is a catch here. But, and I think it's important, if you have a, let's say, a large ganglion cyst or a large cystic appearing lesion near a joint, um, ankle for example, it's sometimes better to give gadolinium to really make sure it's just a, a very subtle rim enhancement because the, the worst case would be a synovial sarcoma which could look very cystic on MRI which is actually not good if the patient uh, well comes for a mass and you just say it's a ganglion cyst and it's actually a synovial sarcoma. 
So um, I've seen cases where this actually happened, where the initial report said, okay, it's a ganglion cyst, but then you give gadolinium and it's completely enhancing, right? So this is kind of a, a little bit more tricky. Now, having said this, if you look here, this is now T1 fat cell after gadolinium. And if I put this next to each other, so the, no, not this one, this one. So you can see it's, First of all, we would say there is just a cyst. So if we if this is a gang cyst, we would not really expect too much enhancement, right? But if you look now on the T1 after gadolinium, you can see we have areas which appear cystic that are enhancing a little bit. And you have now to figure out why this is. So there are two, two options that we actually have. First of all, it could be a Either it's a synovial proliferation or something within here. It could be an indirect arthro effect where you have gadolinium just going in here. But what actually in this case, I think, because it's so polylobulated, um, remember the very thin slices here with all these tiny, let's go here, you know, with all these tiny cysts here. And if they all show some rim enhancement and maybe even some leaking or sweating of gadolinium outside, then it could be that we have an area with a little bit more enhancement. So it's really depending on how you feel and this could be different um, depending on how you feel every day. So you probably experience this yourself. Sometimes you're pretty sure about stuff, sometimes you're not so sure and then you tend to give, okay, maybe it's enhancing a little bit. Maybe we should probably do, I don't know, maybe a follow-up exam uh, depending on where, where they go in and do a arthroscopy to fix this one here. They could technically also maybe even try to do a biopsy there. Um, that's really um, something in this case probably worth discussing with the surgeon or with the orthopedic surgeon if you're not sure, but probably it's just a gang assist. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I think that should be on answered. And SC writes, hello to the people. Yeah, hello to the chat too. Where are you guys from? I know Ruben. I know Ruben is from Mexico by now, uh, but um, just pop in the chat where you're from. I'm curious. Last time it was quite a quite a mix. Okay, so I think that's basically all. It's all for this case, I believe. Yeah, I think that's it. So it's you can't read the chat. I'm not sure why you can't read the chat. Technically, you should be able to read the chat. Why is that not possible? I don't know. Something, something is not working with the stream, so you should basically see the chat. I will have to work on this. Um, yeah. Anyways, so Belgium, Croatia, Austria, Saudi Arabia, Italy, Los Angeles, Germany. Very good. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much for joining in. I think it's uh, it's a good experience for me trying new stuff out here. Poland is also online. Okay. Okay. Moving on to the next case, I think this one was a little bit less fancy. The clinical information, 50 something year old patient with shoulder pain for several months. So it's a very common indication. And I think it's a very nice example for, for two things, if I remember correctly. First of all, um, we can quickly go through the case, I think, from the start, if you, I think we've got enough time. So I have my template that I use for reporting. Sound is low. Oh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, please let me know if there is any issues, but it looks might be on your side. Um, I'm, I don't see any flags here. Okay. So let me continue and um, I hope you have some headset. Maybe you can improve that. It's it's light seven asking because you can't hear me very well. Okay. Oh, Daniel, hi. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. So, as I said, I have my templates that I use for reporting. And if we go quickly through here, I always start at the top with the roof of the shoulder. I describe some osteoarthritis, but again, this little cyst and this very tiny amount of edema there just really it doesn't really matter. It, he will not have symptoms because of that. The joint capsule is not thickened. That's one of the better indicators that a AC joint is actually symptomatic. 
but more on that on the next video. So AC joint osteoarthritis, not so important. Then we don't see um, a lot of fluid in the bursa. Um, sometimes we can see just a very tiny little of fluid or high signal here at this edge, but in this patient, I would probably just say this is within normal limits. And then we have the acromion. There are no spurs uh, looking like maybe in this direction or some bony growths at the undersurface that could cause problems here. So not too much here. Now, then moving on to the tendons, that's the next thing on my list always. We can nicely see here long height of the bicep tendon. Then we have the superior facet here. Everything looking fine. And on the, where is it, sagittal here, starting medially, we can also see there's not too much going on. And the age of the patient, just remember it's 53. Frequently I see reports where they mention tendinopathy, but I'm not a big fan of tendinopathy. Um, and if you, one of the reasons why, if, if you say this is tendinopathy, then probably from now on, every supraspinatus tendon in your life will be tendinopathic, which is probably not true. Um, you can see similar changes in younger people people also with no issue so i'm not a big fan unless the tendon is actually also thickened i think that's one of the better criteria. anyways no tear investment is good terrace minor looking good and even the subscapularis is looking good and your superior portion there's nothing going on here so happy about that now musculature is the next item on my list and you can find all these uh, templates in my book i think you've seen the to add at the end of my videos all the time so i have the, all the templates in the book um, musculature there's no atrophy no re relevant fatty degeneration so looking good and if we have the fluid sensitive sequence there is no edema in the musculature as well so next thing would be then uh, biceps tendon and we can see we've got it down here in the groove right so biceps tendon is nicely centered it's not too thick and we can also have a check at the intra Articular segment, a little bit flattened, but the signal is otherwise not too shabby, right? Something we realize now is there is edema here. We probably saw that already earlier. And this is not in the supraspinatus muscle. So the muscle goes here, probably, um, and it's all going all the way down here. And that's, that's the one thing. And the other thing, but let me just continue with the with the template here first quickly. So we've got that. Uh, I typically do not comment too much on the biceps or biceps pulley in these older patients. I mentioned uh, the fatty tissue here in the rotator interval, and you can see it's part partially obliterated. It's we have some left, but at least half of it is like darker here. And this is also where we have the edema. Uh, this is uh, a good finding and can be an indication of, uh, or can be consistent with adhesive capsulitis in the correct clinical setting. Now, the other thing we can see, there is some other dark signal up here, and there we have to check for other sequences what this could actually be. And it's not well shown on this sequence, but on, yeah, on this se sequence, you can see these round structures. I think there are two or three different so here we've got one here here and here and they are like surrounded with high signal so this is just a little bit fluid of the joint that's collecting up here and we've got three or two loose bodies here in the joint that are collecting up here which is more one of the more frequent sites so this is not air also there was no arthrogram then it shouldn't be air anyways so going back um, to the template we would have now basically uh, the axillary uh, the axilla make sure we don't see any kind of cancer in the lung and no lymphadenopathy you really don't want to miss this just recently i saw a case where there was a desmoid tumor um, like i'm not kidding this big and it was not described two years ago luckily for the patient it was now still the same size so stuff can happen in this region especially lung and lymphadenopathy. Um, yeah, so having said that, moving on to the joint itself. And the joint itself also very nicely, you can see very subtle increase of signal here at the axillary pouch, right here, the anterior portion, and all this kind of thickening or this increased signal 
is also and also the thickness of this one if you want to measure it is a indication that the patient is suffering from adhesive capsulitis okay especially here edema here and all this kind of uh, edema around the joint capsule so i would not write in the conclusion that this is frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis i would say that it can be or it could be consistent with because in the end frozen shoulder i think is more a clinical diagnosis um, we should not really just make this conclusion right out of the bat right so be mindful about this and then yeah you can also see this, this kind of loose bodies up here um, so whenever you see something like this the question is why do they appear does the patient have i don't know some chondral defects and we can try to figure this out so let's see here if we if we go here on the joint we don't see any like major cartilage defects unfortunately this sequence was not really well done or he removed a little bit the patient these again are the loose bodies oh oh snoopy snoopy stardust thank you so much for the contribution it's, uh, rather appreciate it thanks um yeah so i don't see any like major cartilage defects he's 50 something right just quickly check yeah 50 something year old now one side where you have to look for this kind of cartilage defects is up here frequently we miss cartilage defects at this area um, we tend to look always here but frequently they are at this level so just next time go check there yeah i think that's all i had for this case i think i was it was a bit too long maybe now moving on to the last case i think that's a very interesting one it's a foot and it's a young guy 30 something years old and he had a previous crush injury and is now um, unstable uh, and they just wanted to see what's going on and i think the case has a few good points Obviously the stability is one issue and he certainly has ongoing pain. And you can see this here. Look here. Um, you can see uh, there is a lot of edema going on. The navicular bone looks really abnormal. And if you, if you go on the sagittal, you can see. So there was a fracture here. There was, um, yeah, there were more fractures. So basically all these kind of tiny bones were injured in the past. We don't have the prior exam. But it's not really why I show this to you guys. Uh, I think this is just, you know, ju just describe what you see. It's not, not too, too uh, fancy, I guess. But I think there is one finding or a few other findings that are very interesting and something that frequently gets missed. So if you look now or focus more on the medial ligament. So what we tend to do, we look at the deep portion of the deltoid ligament. We look at the tibial spring ligament then maybe on the other ligament tibial calcaneal ligament etc and we sometimes forget this area here so you can see the bone is coming down here nicely and here this is the fascia and the retinaculum etc and you can have stripping of these structures from the underlying bone and this is something that's um, known as the special sleeve of the medial malleolus and it can be evolved or stripped off kind of so normally it should be more like this and it's elevated here and this can lead to chronic pain at the medial uh, malleolus after a ligament injury and it's um, hardly ever reported um, it might be different depending on, on where you get your images from but um, if you get any priors of relevant ankle injuries go and have a look there it's it's frequently there and it can be really a, a painful thing now why is this also important it's not just that we see a reason why the patient could have pain technically what could happen in such cases is if you have the stripping like very extensively technically you could have a, a recurrent dislocation or subluxation of the flexor tendon or the posterior tibial tendon uh, to be more precise here into this newly formed space similar as with the perineal tendons if you have a stripping or an avulsion of the superior perineal retinaculum they can also dislocate this area so it's similar on the medial side i have a separate video about this i don't want to go into too much detail here now but uh, just keep that in mind 
So there are a few other interesting findings I can show you here. First of all, the spring ligament and I have, I think I have a video on YouTube about it. I certainly have a keynote lecture, uh, the one that I gave at the Radiopedia meeting uh, last year, where I talk extensively about the spring ligament. And so sometimes people think about the spring ligament as this kind of hammock that's holding the tailor hat here in place. And if they see something like this, oh, there is a discontinuation. It's actually not a discontinuation. This is just a spring ligament recess between this ligament and this ligament. So uh, keep that in mind. And I think it's very easy to understand once you know how you can really appreciate these two ligaments. So what, this is just a simple trick now. Um, you scroll from proximal to uh, distal. Then you check for the calcaneus. It's coming now here. So we see the calcaneus. Now what you have to do, you have to look for the 90 degree angle of the anterior portion of the calcaneus. So well, it's maybe not the best example. It's not really 90 degrees, but at this notch or at this corner here, you can then see the plantar portions of the tibios, uh, of the um, uh, spring ligament complex. So we've got the supromedial portion, then we've got the, the longitudinal, infraplantar longitudinal and medioplantar oblique ligament portion here. And in between, you can have a gap and this forms the recess. So this is not a tear, this kind of gap here. This is just a spring ligament recess, nicely seen here. But that's also not, not really important um, now for this case, I mean. So the student also then asked me what about this kind of muscle changes down here, right? So there is a little bit of edema and I hope it comes through on the stream. Um, you can see it here. Let me just check, I have to stream open myself. Yeah, I think you can see it. So I can also window it a little bit more aggressive. So you can see here a little bit of edema in the muscle. And basically, let me just check here. Exactly, yeah, so I think you can see it here. So in the abductor halitz, is, is, uh, there's a little bit of edema in the more distal portions of it. And if we go to the more or the larger field of view, even here in the flexor halitz brevis, in the most distal portion, there is, I think there might be somewhere else. So we can also here see in the flexor sigitorum brevis, also some edema. Now, why does the patient have edema there and so there are a few differential diagnoses that we can discuss maybe because he has this trauma and everything maybe um, it's mechanically induced maybe he's walking differently maybe he needs more you know more muscle activity to maintain his uh, function and it could be something like delayed onset muscle soreness from, from from recent activity for example and the question is always with edema could it be denervation right now one argument against it would be, okay, it's not the whole muscle that's affected and it's not fatty degenerated. So there is no fatty atrophy. But then look at all the, these kind of plantar changes here. So it must really have been an ugly injury. You can see the aponeurosis is really like a lot of scarring going on. The muscle, different muscle groups are like scarred together. They are not separated anymore by fat planes, etc. Um, all the way down here. And even here, it's it's kind of a tent, has, has kind of a tent shape here. So there was a re relevant injury. And if you see something like this, and we should check the nerves, right? So we go check the nerves. And where can we check the nerves? Maybe on this one. Tibial nerve and its two branches, medial and lateral plantar nerve. Um, it's not well visualized here. We can hardly appreciate it. It's here, it could be technical, but maybe it's just the image quality here, which is a little bit hazy. But if we go, I think, on this one, and we are now on the posterior aspect, we have the tibial nerve coming down. So here, so this is the, just along the vessels, basically. This is the, I have to zoom in. So this one here is the, the nerve, and then we've got the branches, basically. Um, so, let me just do this like this. So 
we can nicely see it. So maybe even the T1. And then we do the caliper here. Okay, so you can see this is the nerve up here. Normal signal, so nothing um, strange here. And this is just at the level where we got the, the split between the two bundles, like the medial and the lateral portion. But what happens then? So we scroll down and we can now see this kind of bright structure here, this one. And that's actually not a vessel. This is, this is if we follow it through, this is actually the nerve. So the medial plantar nerve is a very high signal here and it's indicating that it's some neuropathy going on here. We don't really know the exact clinical symptoms and but it's certainly too bright on a fluid sensitive weighted sequence and we've got all this scarring down here so it could well be that there is maybe some just some singular branches of the nerve that are affected by this. Um, it's really not 100% clear to be honest. Um, it could be that it's impinged from here is the master node of Henry where the two tendons cross it's at this level, but I don't think it has to do anything with it. There is no fluid or in the tendon sheath here at the crossing of the FHL and FDL. So it, I would just describe this and I think it would need a clinical correlation as well because we see just patchy edema at different muscles, but they are all innervated by the medial plantar nerve. So this is quite um, now difficult to bring under one, one hood, I would say. But this was a very interesting uh, finding here. Maybe the neuropathy or the, the nerve change could also still be from the initial trauma. I don't have any prior exams to really come to that conclusion. And there's also maybe a little bit high signal on the lateral branch here as well. So it's not 100% clear, but I think it's good to realize this kind of scarring that's going on on the plantar side here in the soft tissue of the foot. Best seen here with the distortion of the fat planes and this kind of tent shape uh, scarring etc going on together with all the other findings so I think that was a very good good case so let's see whether there are any more questions um, Mike asks how far lateral does humeral head or particular cartilage extend so with lateral I would assume you mean on a sagittal how far the cartilage reaches here at this level so the you don't have cartilage anymore on the footprint itself where the tendon inserts and it then just bleeds out here at this level, basically. That's um, where the cartilage stops. Let's see where we have maybe a, a, a nicer image that could technically show this to you. So here you can see the cartilage here, this is a little bit higher signal structure. So this is the cartilage and it stops somewhere around here. There might be a very tiny portion going deeper, but we don't see it based on the resolution that we are having, but certainly here where the tendon inserts on the facets, there is no cartilage anymore. I think that that should answer your questions. So yeah, thank you guys. thanks guys. So if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat. Uh, we can have a look at them in the last two or three minutes, but if nothing is coming up, I would uh, like to thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I'm playing around with these different streaming streaming softwares. It's a pity that the chat is not showing. Um, I think I need to do more bug fixing in this regard. But eventually I will figure it out. Yes. Okay, now the questions are coming. Ruben, post-op MRI after ACL repair video in the future. Yeah, Ruben, that's a good topic. I will con consider that. And how about the shoulder ligaments? I think that would be, that's a little bit too broad, Bruno, but I keep that in mind. I've got, I have several videos about uh, shoulder ligaments actually with the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex and also the pulley anatomy. So Bruno, go check my YouTube channel. You should find uh, detailed descriptions of the anatomy there. Okay. With that, I'd like to close. Um, if you just tuned in at the later stage, don't forget that you can Go back on YouTube, I think it should be available. It's either available right now or tomorrow or so, or even day after tomorrow, and you can watch the replay. So it's available for everybody to see then as well. That's it, thanks for watching. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Tuning out. <laughs>